if you don't tell me, then, you know, you can't come to work. It can do that. Or a store can say, if you won't tell me, I won't let you in my store. Hi, guys. We have Professor Oren Lipper, who is joining us from the University of Las Vegas, who will be talking to us about health law. That is very important at this uh, COVID-19 times as we are coming out from pandemic. David, please introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm David Orientlicker. I'm the Judge Jack and Lulu Lehman Professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, or UNLV, as we say, School of Law in Las Vegas. I've been there for about four years now, and I also direct the UNLV Health Law Program, which is a joint effort uh, by the School of Law and the School of Public Health. We also work with the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, and other schools uh, on health law activities. What do you think are the most important questions consumers are going to be faced as we are coming out from the pandemic? Of course, their number one issue is what's safe to do and what's not safe to do. And in terms of health law, an important question is, what can we do or what should we be doing in order to encourage or even require people to follow good public health rules? When we're talking about COVID-19 or other communicable diseases, a patient's decision affects a lot of other people. And so health law changes a lot when it comes to public health and, and sort of the general view that it's up to the patient to decide no longer holds. And so what are the limits to patient self-determination and patient autonomy when we get into the public health arena? That's a very important area. And, you know, the Supreme Court first addressed this over 100 years ago, almost 120 years ago, when there was a smallpox outbreak. And this was in Massachusetts in the city of Cambridge. They adopted an ordinance saying everybody needs to be vaccinated against smallpox. And there were objectors. And the Supreme Court came down on the side of the government saying if there's a, an important health risk at stake, then we leave it up to the public health authorities to decide what's in the public interest. And so... This was Reverend Jacobson, who was um, prosecuted for refusing to be immunized. Well, he was fined, and that was the punishment to be fined. And he objected to being fined for not having a vaccine. And so uh, the Supreme Court said, no, the state's entitled to, to require. But no, they didn't re actually force him to be vaccinated, they find him for not being vaccinated. We, we don't always go the full step and say, we're gonna impose a treatment. Sometimes we do. People who have tuberculosis, where if they, can, if they don't undergo treatment, they put other people at risk for tuberculosis, courts will say, you need to be treated. Now in England, they'll say, if you don't wanna be treated, then you can stay isolated and by yourself, so you're not putting anybody else at risk. So that's what they'll do in England. They'll say, um, you don't have a right to spread your tuberculosis, but you do have a right to refuse treatment. In the United States, we will, courts will say, uh, we're gonna insist that you be treated because tuberculosis is such a serious disease and we don't want other people at risk. Keep up, health insurance, insurance privacy, laws that exist. They're very strict in the United States. Uh, each patient records are protected by law. They cannot be distributed freely. COVID-19 vaccination is different. There are public records about who is vaccinated, who is not. They're trackable, traceable, as far as I understand and as far as I know. People are talking about passports, read passports, so to speak, all around the world. How does it work? Patient your confidentiality of your medical information is very important and it's long standing 
Um, and whatever, you know, if you look at different codes of medical ethics, patient confidentiality is one of the essential requirements that we want to make sure that patients are comfortable disclosing full information to doctors, because unless you know everything about the patient's health and their life, you're not, it's going to, you can't give them optimal care. Um, so to make sure patients are comfortable disclosing information that's intimate, private, and, and could be embarrassing or could subject them to discrimination, doctors promise, and the law holds doctors to their promise, that they won't share the information. And the federal law that you mentioned, the health information, a HIPAA law, that um, what it says is when you share your information with your healthcare providers, they can't share it with other people. But there are exceptions. And one of the important exceptions is in the context of public health. So there are a lot of public health reporting requirements that if people are diagnosed with a communicable disease off with many significant communicable diseases, that's something that doctors are required to report to the public health department. Um, but when it comes to COVID, we don't ordinarily you're not required to disclose your COVID status, but it's also an important public health issue. So if your employer can require that you be that, you know, the employer has to worry about the health of your coworkers and the customers. And so the employer can say, we want to make sure that you're not coming to, to work infected with COVID and at risk to spread it to coworkers and customers. Or businesses can say if, to customers, we don't want you to spread your COVID infection or other infections to our employees or our other customers. So we want to make sure that you're healthy when you come in um, to our premises. So they can set rules now and that can require you to, to, to make sure that, you know, you either have a negative COVID test or you've been immunized or you can show other evidence you've been infected in the past and now you have antibodies, but they can require businesses and employers can require that you prove that you're healthy and that you're not putting other people at risk. There are um, exceptions. So there are two important exceptions to the freedom of employers or businesses to, you know, inquire about your health status. Um, one is if you've got a health reason, you've got a disability um, that could put you at risk for a immunization, or you have religious ob ob objections to an immunization. So there are accommodations that are required um, up to a point. In the end, your disability accommodations or your religious accommodations don't mean that the employer or the business has to put their other employees or, co or customers at risk. They, they have to make reasonable accommodations. So it may be, let's say you're, you work for a business, a reasonable accommodation might be that you work in a, an isolated setting. You're the only person in the room or you wear an N95 mask while you're working or, or you work at home. So as long as there can be accommodations or if you're a customer, can we um, serve you, you know, maybe bring whatever you want to buy. We, you, you drive up and we, for pickup and we, bring it out to your car. We don't, so you don't have to come in to the store to, to do your shopping. So those are the kinds of accommodations that are required. But in the end, if there's no way to allow you to do your job or allow you to be a customer without putting other people at risk, then um, the public health trumps your individual rights. And this is very important, uh, I want to stress that uh, 
So what you're saying is public health considerations would go above individual desires of not being vaccinated. If employer cannot accommodate you, you will most likely be let go if it cannot be accommodated. Is my understanding correct? Yeah, they, yes, exactly. Their employers are entitled to say, we want to have to, to have a safe workplace or a safe sh- shopping place. Uh, we want to we want everybody to be vaccinated. And so there's a, a court case that was just decided by the trial court in Houston, where a major hospital said to all its employees, you need to be vaccinated. And and some of you know, there were employees who objected and they sued and they've they've lost it at the trial level. I expect that won't change as it moves through appeal. But yes, you're, if you have a legitimate reason for not being vaccinated, again, could be a disability, it could be a religious reason, the employer has to accommodate. The legal term is, you, you know, it can't... Uh, impose an undue hardship on the, on the employer, or it can't frustrate the operation of the, uh, of whatever enterprise that if it's a hospital delivering healthcare, if you're taking care of patients and you could be infected with COVID and you could spread it, then that doesn't, that can't happen. It's not acceptable in a healthcare setting. So that's why we tend to see these kinds of mandates first in healthcare settings, but other employers are entitled to require it. And um, I, I, I think airlines, there are some airlines that are requiring vaccinations for new employees and, and they're entitled to do that. Um, even though there are important rights at stake, public health that's considered such an important interest for the society as a whole that the government's entitled and, and also private businesses to, you know, to implement public health protections. The, the one area where we're seeing courts in re- this past year, the Supreme Court has um, overturned some restrictions in New York City and, and a few other places where um, they infringed on religious freedoms now, normally, as I, now, as I said before, public health does trump religion. However, what the courts were concerned there and said, and, and then rejected the restrictions on, on religious activities was because they felt they weren't applying their restrictions in an even-handed way. They were treating religious uh, churches or synagogues differently than they were treat, treating other places where people would gather. And they said, if you know, you're entitled to limit people's gathering indoors and requiring them to physically separate and limit capacity and require masks and all those measures, you have to do it in an even handed way. You can't impose greater burdens on re- religious organizations than on secular organizations. Uh, so that's where we've seen um, some courts intervene on behalf of individual liberty. Can a business owner discriminate based on the vaccination status, whether to allow or not to allow customers to walk in or not to walk in? Yeah, so if you are pro- if you have a business and you want to say, to come into my store, you have to show that you've been immunized, as a general matter, the answer is yes, as long as some businesses, not all businesses, but there's a Civil Rights Act from 1964 that applies to what are called public accommodations, privately owned businesses that are open generally to the public, restaurants, hotels, and other businesses. If you're one of those businesses, um, as you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of religion or race. So again, if you apply it to everybody and um, and you make reasonable accommodations for people with religion um, or disabilities, doesn't again 
put other people at risk or make it impossible to, for you to carry out your business. But let's say, you know, I have health reasons or religious reasons for not being immunized. I'll wear an N95 mask when I come into your store. And, and then you, this would be a factual question. Is the fact that they're wearing an N95 mask provide sufficient protection for employees and other customers? And if public health experts said, yeah, if, as long as they're wearing an N95 mask, that's, that's safe, that makes for a safe setting, then they would have to do it. But if it turned out that, well, an N95 mask maybe is only 95% or 90% effective. And so it, it would get down to a factual question. But the general idea that, yes, you can require people to be immunized, yes. Now, what? even though you have the legal right to do that, businesses are, most businesses are going to be reluctant, right? They don't want to antagon, alienate potential customers. So, you know, a lot of them will try workarounds um, to try to avoid that kind of a rule. But if they want to do it, they could do it. I mean, the other thing you're seeing is a lot of states have passed laws prohibiting vaccine passports. So um, several states, more states have have rejected vaccine passports and said that we're not allowing them in our state. And um, New York is one, the one state that I know of so far that has created a vaccine passport program. You can you know, go online and, and apply for a vaccine passport in New York. They, the state doesn't require it yet, but they, this program is for businesses that want to require it. The state has created a program so you can demonstrate that you have the vaccine passport. But in, in a lot of other states, uh, the legislatures have prohibited vaccine passports. So um, the fact that a state can do it doesn't mean they have to do it or will do it. And so we're seeing different policies in different you know, across the country. If someone is asking another person about the uh, COVID vaccination status, can a person refuse to answer? You can always refuse to provide information. Nobody can force you. They, you know, if it's your employer, they can say, if you don't tell me, then, you know, you can't come to work. They can do that. Or a store can say, if you won't tell me, I won't let you in my store. So they, so you may lose opportunities if you don't disclose your information. Dual citizens, they have been vaccinated in one country by emergency use vaccine in that country. They're traveling into U.S. What's going to happen? Are they vaccinated citizens or not? Yeah, well, it would depend if it's a, if it's a vaccine that has been approved in the United States, then it shouldn't matter where you got the vaccine. The, the key question is, which vaccine did you get? Let's look back at last year and a half. Where do you think U.S. government, U.S. rules, sayings, constitution worked or failed during the pandemic? I think the big problem was implementation. We didn't have as the coordinated kind of response we needed. You know, we normally public health measures are done by states. That's where we expect, you know, the 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 rules and policies to come from from state public health agencies. With travel being so easy now and having a communicable disease, if you don't have a a national coordinated response, that's a big problem. And the other problem we saw in the early days of COVID was states had to fight each other for the protective equipment for healthcare providers, the masks, 
the, the ventilators. And that's not a very effective way to deal with a public health crisis. It's a national crisis to have each state having to, to fight for the um, resources it needs. So that was the big failure that we, we just didn't coordinate the 50 states so that we could maximize our response. And some states did better than others. Yeah, in general, people do need to learn more about what their rights are because they often don't realize how much the law is there to protect them. And when it comes to their privacy and their freedom to decide and the security of their information, there are lots of laws to protect them. Um, and in, in other healthcare settings, um, they would be in a much better position to assert those interests. When we're dealing with public health, though, you know, then it's a different ball game. And, and there, because of the risk to other people, um, the law does allow a lot of limitations. Um, so there, the important thing is to make sure that when public health measures are adopted, that they really are based on science because our experience when people came back from Africa who were at risk with Ebola, we overreacted there. Um, and so there are, we do have to be careful that sometimes the government is, you know, doesn't, res you know, responds in an irrational way. So, uh, you know, I think making sure that public, the government authorities, public health officials follow the science. That's the most important thing. And, and that's getting back to you asked what mistakes were made. That was one of the mistakes early on when people were discouraged from wearing masks. And, and that was a problem because it turns out masks are important. And, and, and you know, part of it was we, we had a shortage of masks, but that wasn't the message. The message was you don't need a mask, not actually, it would be good if you had a mask and if you can make, you know, do it yourself, do it. But we, we you know, we have to allocate our, the mask that we have to the people with the greatest need. And, and I, that, that really hurt when, um, you know, public health officials weren't as honest as they should and transparent as they should have been. Thank you for your time. And we really appreciate you having speaking to us and our viewers.